Hi, everyone. This is Angel Borelli, and welcome to Season 7, Episode 3 of The Fix. And wow, what a day and a week and the last few weeks of baseball. We're recording on October 8th, 2020, and we are in the middle of the division playoffs. And wow, what a season. And so I would be remiss if I didn't talk today about some of the wonderful teaching moments and take-home messages that we as coaches can learn from the MLB. And here to do that with me is my favorite baseball coach, Coach Larry Owens of Bellarmine University. Hey, Larry. Hey, Angel. How are you doing? Great. How are you doing today? Doing great. Awesome. So let's get started with your own personal segment, Top of the First. What's on your mind today? I don't know. I just, last we spoke, I was kind of, you know, him hauling around on, on what topic to kind of touch on. And one thing that stuck out was that I wanted to make sure that it would maybe uh, help people or have them look at things a little differently. And so it's going to pertain to pitching. And there's many pieces that, you know, make a complete pitcher that, that include the delivery, which you're, you know, extremely good at. Um, and, the, and of course, functional strength and, and training a pitcher to pitch. And there's other things like holding runners and fielding your position. And then, you know, w- one big piece is a mental part of the game awareness. And I just want to kind of address or touch on that, you know, we, we discussed it with our pitchers just yesterday that, you know, regardless of age, a great place for a pitcher to be in the, as, as they develop is get to the point where they don't fear an outcome, where they don't worry about what's going to happen when they let go of the ball. And I think far too many pitchers, young pitchers, and, and it's very common that they fear an outcome. What, what it leads them to do is pitch to create swings and misses or throw perfect pitches. And in doing so, then they create deep counts, which statistically or, you know, the odds of them getting the hitter out go down. They put the hitter in a, they put hitters in hitters count. And by the simple fact of them not you know, trying to get away from worrying about what's going to happen when they let go of the ball, they don't have any control over whether the guy, whether the hitter swings at it, whether he hits it, whether he misses it, how hard he hits it, where he hits it. They have no control over any of that. The only thing that they should be focused on is trying to execute the pitch at that particular time. The most important pitch is the pitch in that moment. That's the most important thing they're, they're, that they need to worry about, if anything, or focus on executing. And too many times I just think it gets in the way. And I'm sure that, you know, hopefully I, I'd like to think a lot of people that listen can relate, you know, to that and have probably been there before where they're, they're stopping, they're holding themselves back from doing something they're completely capable of doing. And it's all, they just kind of let their head get in the way or they let fear get in the way. And that's, fear is a good thing. I think fear is a good thing to, to have, but when it overwhelms you so much that you can't perform, then that's, then that's another thing. And so I don't know, I just thought it was a, you know, something that I, that I wanted to kind of get out there and just, you know, make people aware that it's, it's an issue and it's something that we look for. Usually when guys nibble and try to, you know, they're constantly behind the counter, they're constantly behind the count and they, are they nibbling because they, you know, because they're incapable of throwing strikes or, or are they doing so because they don't want to get hit hard? I think it's a pretty common thing that happens, and it's something that I deal with every year with freshmen coming in. Some freshmen are more fearful than others. Some, you know, it, it affects everybody different. Yes, I actually I love hearing you talking about it because so oftentimes coaches are I don't know if it's coaches or what, but so oftentimes we think that the only goal is to throw strikes, and that's all we talk about or look at. We want them to throw strikes, but throwing strikes is a product of having the right delivery, knowing what, when to throw what pitch, and also having the mental framework to be able to actually let the pitcher inside of you come out. And so what I think you're saying is, and this is a perfect lead into one of the topics I wanted to talk about, is the fact that pitchers can shoot themselves in their foot w- with going into a place in their head that one, not only creates a worse problem, but also doesn't allow them to actually be the pitcher that they are. So I think one of the things you said that I loved is you mentioned a few times situations. You mentioned nibbling, which is, I think, <laughs> I've never heard that term, but that I know exactly what you mean. And they start becoming more involved in the external game of trying to create something out there rather than being inside being who they are having their game plan and executing and overcoming 
and not being in that moment where you have adversity and you fall prey to it. Does that make sense, Larry? You like switch from your own self into what the other, what the hitter is doing, and then you stop believing in yourself. And in the process of all that thinking, you're not moving correctly. Correct. Which then is a double whammy on your ability to locate pitches. Does that, is that kind of what you're saying as well? Absolutely. Yeah. It affects everyone. You know, and you're all because your mind goes to a place where you have absolutely no control over what's about to happen. Exactly. It can snowball and it can, you know, it can not only lead to, you know, hitter after hitter, but inning after inning and outing after outing. And it can just become a big, big major problem. And then when you perform like that, then all of a sudden you're not going to get innings. Then you're not going to pitch because you're not going to help your team. Exactly. Well, you just said something kind of, I think, really important, which is you start trying to control what what's happening. And the deal is, is that pitchers have to be able to control themselves, not the other situation. And from that personal control and that personal demeanor, which we all know when we see someone with demeanor, from that you can execute. And I remember way back when I got into pitching and I was working with some pretty good pitchers. So I started meeting scouts and they started talking to me and they were teaching me what what bounce back meant. And they said, yeah, we look for good bounce back. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, it's the way that what the guy does after he gives up a home run. It's what the pitcher does after he's gotten himself into a bad situation. And I said, wow. And it was so enlightening to me to think about it that way. Now, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this topic and my own list of things to talk about is, and again, I think everyone knows, I don't ever mention names of pitchers that we see because number one, those pitchers are somebody's sons. Those are human beings. I have the greatest respect for them. And if something happens to them, listen, they're suffering worse than the audience who is so upset because they didn't deliver the way that for the team, the way they wanted their team to go. But there were some great pitchers just in the last few weeks, some were in the wild card games and some recently this week in the playoffs. But there were pitchers who undoubtedly are great pitchers. They came into the game with fantastic stats And there was no reason to ever even wonder about them. And to the shock of most everyone, one pitcher, he came into the game so distraught after the first or second pitch, and he could not get it together and ended up being pulled after X number of innings. And you could visually see on his face something you never saw before, which is you knew he was, you could tell he was in mental stress. Another pitcher that I saw recently who was amazing, this guy struck out, Larry, like seven guys in a row, and then all of a sudden he gets some bad calls, and even though he was trying to act okay, you could tell he went into a a hard game phase, and he ended up loading the bases and throwing like, I would say maybe six balls in a row. I mean, it was unreal, the change. And the coach had to go out and talk to him. And all of a sudden, something happened and he flipped back and ended up getting himself back. And, you know, I have a lot of people texting me during the games because, uh, you know, they're just texting me. They know I'm watching. And especially if I'm watching, you know, one of my favorite teams, which everyone knows I'm a Yankees fan. So I'm you know, getting texts and I'm actually telling them, watch, look at this picture. You can visibly see the stress. And one of the one take home message that I have been talking to my pitchers about is if you're under mental stress, you can't hide it. You can think you have game face, but you actually don't. But the other deal is it's not the way you're acting. It's what you're thinking. And when you're not thinking right or you're telling yourself a story, which is exactly what happens, they're telling a story. Oh, no, I'm not going to make this strike or whatever it is that you pitchers say to yourself up there when you're trying and disappointed in the outcome and you're worried about the next one. And I've heard you say more than once, Larry, you have to throw a pitch and forget it. 
You know, you can't let the next pitch be affected by the pitch you just threw. So one of the things I thought was interesting is as much as these guys were professionals, you could tell visibly. And I was telling my younger pitchers, notice that he's losing it. You can't hide it, but it then affects the rest of the performance. So do you have you watched any games and or have you ever seen that happen where you all of a sudden visually you could see something's changed in the pitcher? Sure, you see it happen because of adversity, which is there's those are things that we want to see as you know, as coaches or scouts when you're evaluating people, you want to see how they handle failure. Other ways it happens is, is uh, for example, a pitcher is just cruising and he's never had anybody on base in three innings. And all of a sudden in the fourth inning he has the first base runner and now he's got to deal with them from the set and he hasn't done it the entire game yet. So, you know, now he has to deal with throwing uh, somewhat of a different delivery from the set. And then that can affect his performance or an umpire's call or you know, any, anything, a, a bad hop on the infield, anything can affect it. You know, it's easy to play when things are going well, but like, you know, like you talked about bounce back, how are they going to, how are they going to handle a little adversity? How are they going to handle you know, things when you know it doesn't all go well? And the, the better ones handle it more often. And the guys that the guys that don't handle it as well aren't as successful typically. Yes. So when I saw this, and I'm so glad you brought this up today, I started thinking about so what do I as a coach? What do I create in the way? Because with me, yes, I'm working with their mechanics, their pitching motion, but you know, I'm with them so much. I especially the younger ones, I'm actually developing them. And I think, you know, as a coach, our what we do isn't bl- black and white. I mean, if you see a, co- a player with bad behavior, even though we're dealing with their pitching, if he's got bad behavior in the dugout or on the field, we're going to call him on it because we're coaches and because we're adults. And our job is to teach anybody that we come in contact with as one of our players, our clients, whatever it is. It's our responsibility to make sure these kids, and most of them are kids, get all the information they need to be a better version of themselves. So I said, you know, I want to come up with what is a solution for this because I have pitchers, you know, I get sent game film. And when I see a pitcher, he'll say, I had a terrible game. And I see, I can see that he was rushing. He was nervous. He was this. And he looks completely different. I mean, we know bullpen video is different than game video. But if you got a guy who's great in a bullpen, he can throw strikes. He's, you know, when you're simulating innings, he's getting outs. And then he goes in a game and he's completely different. Then you know there's something he's saying to himself. And you also know this isn't a good thing. I mean, if he's different, but he's performing. But if it's a consistent non-performance, then you know you've got something going on. So it would it just happen to be that with noticing all this with the games and the professionals and having two pitchers, that I work with that have sensitivities to this, it made me think about what do we as coaches, what do we have to do? And I think one thing is we have to make this a tangible thing, just like you practice PFPs and you do, you know, this and you do that, that there's got to be, we have to have conversations and education to the pitchers about this very thing. Because the pressure now, not only is there pressure inherent in the game, but when they're in a situation like a pitcher goes all of a sudden to a showcase, let's say a high school pitcher where the coaches aren't using track, man, or rap soda, they don't have the money on the fields to do it. They just, you know, they're old school, whatever. They go to these showcases and now everything is being measured. So we have pitchers that are under a an additional type of stress. And I think that we have to come up with a way to add this to our training of the pitchers. So one of the things that I think everything always begins with is education about what really happens when you're on the mound telling yourself a story. And that is what happens. And we catch ourselves doing it all day. Someone doesn't call you back or someone acts a certain way and our brain immediately goes to, oh, wow, they're acting funny today. Or, gee, did, what did he just do? And before you know it, your emotions on the inside are reacting to your words. Also, you're in a particular part of your brain, the part of your brain that actually talks and the part of your brain that actually talks to yourself. When you're in that part of your brain, your body becomes a victim to that. 
Now, when we are performing sports, we're in a part of the brain that is an automatic part of the brain. It's why you don't have to think about how to pick up your cup of coffee. You don't have to think about every finger stroke when you're typing. You don't have to think about how do you turn on your car and drive and put it in reverse. Remember, when we started learning how to drive, we had to think, okay, let's see, put the foot on the brake before we parallel park. I mean, we had to go in steps and it's weird to go in steps, but all of a sudden, once you repeat it, it transfers into the automatic part of the brain. The second the pitcher comes out of the automatic part of the brain, the firing of the muscles that he needs for his performance end up going to a diff- through a different route. It's like the short route to get somewhere and the long route to get somewhere. The short route is you're working from the center of your brain that's automatic. You've been pitching since you were a kid. You know how to put the ball in the glove, spin the ball to get the grip, throw the ball, and you're not thinking about anything except where you want to locate it. The part of the brain that goes around and around before it gets to the muscle, it's taking so much time and it's not coming in the same way that the movements are not smooth. They're not as quick. The whole system, the whole fluidity of the motion changes. So the education that pitchers need to know is, I think everybody thinks that this is an abstract thing going mental or getting emotional or whatever. It is a thing that can be controlled and changed, but the change has to come from them understanding that they're actually interfering with the way their body moves on an inside level, on a physiological level. It's not just, so in other words, yelling at yourself saying, come on, get it together, get it together. In those moments, you're actually interfering that you need your brain to slip back into that mode of moving that's automatic. And in my opinion, starting with education is first. And then our second job is to come up with a solution for that. In other words, so what can take the place or what do we do to get them out of the mode of, I'm going to call it storytelling, the storytelling about what they just did and I'll never be able to throw a strike again. And oh my God, I'm walking and I haven't had anybody on base in four innings. Oh, my pitching must be going down. Oh no, this is going to remind me of two years ago when I had, yeah, you know, I was at the seventh inning and all that happens in a millisecond. And it is a visual thing that you can see. Have you ever seen that Larry, where you can kind of absolutely tell the pitchers in stress But all of a sudden, he starts moving differently. And for each pitcher, it's different. He might start racing out of the glove. He might start falling over in his follow through. He might have different things he does you've never seen him do. Have you ever uh, witnessed that demise of the physical when you see the emotional breaking down? All the time. And that's usually more often than not, that's what it is. It's, It's, I don't know, I see kids at this level. It's just so they let their head get in the way of everything. And, and, you know, it's something that, you know, we train the delivery, we train all this stuff. We train the, the, you know, like you talked about the PFPs and the bunk coverages, everything that pertains to pitching, but we don't spend a lot of time, you know, mentally, because I don't know that a lot of us know how to do it. And I don't know, everybody thinks of it differently, I guess. I don't know. We should spend more time on it, but yeah, it happens when guys, you know, go South so to speak, and, and not perform really well, a lot of times it's it's just it's something going on in their head. Yes, it's absolutely true. And it is a physical thing. That's what I, so I think the first thing is for uh, at whatever level, and I'm speaking down, not down, I'm speaking, um, if, I, if we were in a, a, a lecture on motor control and what I just said, because there's names for the systems, et cetera, it is so complicated. But the take home message is, one, it's not abstract, the results of your storytelling. It's not abstract. Absolutely, your body cannot. It's just like when I'm teaching someone, I'm saying your body cannot learn when you're yelling at yourself for not doing it. And then I have to explain 
the similar thing I just said. So for all coaches to understand this, just to understand that it isn't abstract and to be able to explain you're actually interfering with the automaticness of your pitching motion. So now the solution, I, I think everyone knows this. I've said it before, before I got into going to graduate school for my master's and being able to analyze mechanics, I was working on my master's in sports psychology. I was already a strength coach. I was already working with pitchers. And I thought, and my bachelor's was in psychology. And I said, this is a perfect add-on for me. I had one semester left and I got up and walked out in the middle of a class and said, I'm never going back. I was so sick of hearing tricks. Imagine yourself on a a beach when you feel yourself getting nervous or visualize that. And I'm like, what the heck? I said, if the pitcher can figure out how to get back to performing well, he's not going to be telling himself bad stories, you know? And so I was always one. I don't want to do the abstract stuff because it's not going to work, you know? And I have had pitchers tell me, I had a pro pitcher tell me once, yes, well, they told me to do this and that and visualize this. And I'm shaking my head thinking, no, I don't think so, because you're in an athletic, physical, physical place. So the solution needs to be in something that relates to the skill. So I left, started doing what I'm doing now and have always been an advocate and against giving pitchers an extra assignment. Okay, now when you when your palms are sweating, now I want you to picture yourself on the beach relaxing. No, that is not my style. It might be another person's style. The style should be whatever works with the person you're talking to. So what I do, and actually I've had the capability of practicing this, and actually I did this within the last two weeks with somebody, is I said, because simultaneous to watching pitchers fall apart that are great and actually letting my pitchers know, look at, look how great they are and they fell apart. So know that you're not alone. That's the first thing. They have to know they're not alone. Second, that they can change it. And third, you give them a tool with which to change it. The other thing I happen to be pondering on during this series is, I don't think we practice right in the bullpen all the time. I don't think we're focusing enough on the architecture of the pitch selection and practice a strategy. I mean, you, Larry, being at the level you're at, I'm probably taught us preaching to the choir here. But when pitchers come to me and they're or I watch pitchers throwing a bullpen, the coach will say, hey, watch them and blah, blah, blah. There's something that's missing. And so I started thinking, you know, there's got to be. We don't practice one pitch enough in the gym. And I'm an Olympic weightlifting coach, and which is Olympic lifts are snatches and cleans. You practice them until you get them right. I'm going, if the guy can't locate his change up, he's in a bullpen. He doesn't locate three change or a change up. He's mixing in his pitches. So he goes from that missed change up to a fastball to something else. What happened to go back to that change up and throw it till you get it right? What happened to exactly what we do in life when we're trying to learn something? So I said to myself, you know, I got to come up with a solution for this kid that was losing it. And so I said, come here. And I brought the catcher over and I said, I want you to tell me on the first hitter, I want you to give me four pitches. If you want to confuse the hitter, tell me what you're going to do. So he named four pitches. I said, so tell me why you picked him. Now, of course, I'm asking questions that sometimes I'm asking questions that are beyond my pay grade because I'm not a pitcher. I understand this stuff, but I let I want the pitcher to explain it to me. The process isn't what he's doing. It's that he's doing it. Well, I'm going to throw him a slider because I'm going to bring his eye to this corner, blah, blah. And so he's going on talking like that. Awesome. So you're going to throw those four pitches no matter what. He goes, yes. I said to the catcher, he can't leave this mound until he has those four pitches. I Don't come, come back up to me when he's executed all four pitches. By the time he was on his 13th pitch, he had gone through the cycle. And each cycle, he had missed one or the other. By, I think it was the third package of that. Oh, and by the way, this was 
from pitch number one in the bullpen because I had already seen video. This kid was crazy. I didn't even want him to throw any pitches that didn't have an intent. So I did something I never do, which is I didn't even let him throw 15 pitches before I threw something on him. I said, obviously, you're not warmed up. So we're not going to be throwing real hard. Your body will regulate it. I said, but right now, I only want you concerned with you've got to hit those spots exactly. And I told the catcher, he's got to hit them exactly. So by the third third round or fourth, they came, they both, they stopped, they walked up to me. And the catcher said, yeah, he was blah, blah, blah. And he starts giving me the report. He says, but man, by the second, this one, he got every one of them. And the pitcher looks at me. And of course, he doesn't know what I'm doing. I haven't said, oh, you've got a mental game problem. I'm going to work with it. He goes, Angel, it's the weirdest thing. He said, all of a sudden, I got so involved. I went into this tunnel. He used the word tunnel. And all of a sudden, I was like determined that I was going to make these pitches go to this place. And I, that's all I was thinking about. And I said, awesome. And since that time, he has had very successful outings because I said to him, now you've got a formula for what you're supposed to be focusing on. And now what you're doing is you're dealing with yourself and what you can do and not adjusting what you're doing based on what the hitter's doing or someone else is doing or the umpire is doing. And it was probably one of the most successful things I've done with this guy who's a good pitcher. So what that is, is I came up with something else for him to do that he was so focused on and a game plan that he couldn't deter from. And plus it was an assignment. So he, and he, and he loves to follow directions. So I tricked him. And he had a completely different bullpen than he's ever had. And since then, he's had outings like he's never had. That is what I did. That's just a sample. Now, you guys know way better than me and have way more options. But the what we want to come up with is you want to, one, educate the pitcher on what I said about it is physical. You actually are digging yourself in a hole. And instead of trying to yell at yourself and have a battle with, I don't want to show that I'm under stress, literally shift gears and become involved in something else. Pitchers need to be involved in the strategy more than they actually are. Sometimes they're strategizing on the fly, departing from who they are and what they throw well to replace it with something that they're doing. And you coaches have way more options available to you because you literally actually are in the dugout being the architect in some ways, but the pitcher needs to be in that mode when he's on the mound. So when you're focusing, then you've got your storytelling. You're not storytelling. Now you're in a different part of your brain that is distracted And now that automatic part of your brain, it goes into gear. And that's the trick. So if you can take that model that I just said worked with my pitcher and come up with your own thing pertinent to what you know about the pitcher and also the tools available to you, like Larry, you've got way more tools available to you than I do because, you know, that's what you do. You're 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 working around the plate in your head for the pitcher, the pitcher needs to stay around the plate too. And that's how you get yourself to slip back into motor control center instead of the physical center, which causes problems. Does that make any sense? No doubt. Just trying to get, I mean, with anything, you're, you you want to obviously do it without thinking about it. But if you're having issues, I, I, I prefer, I always thought, I mean, it might be a little bit off, not off topic, but I always thought about I don't want you to worry about what not to do. I want you to do what you know you're supposed to do. It it maybe helps you think positively or think like, here's what's going to happen. Instead of, well, don't fly off this pitch. Don't do this. Don't do that. No, don't worry about what you're not going to get you. You know, if you're focused on, yeah, I got to throw this. Like you talked about, I have to throw these four pitches in sequence and command all four of them. Then that's the focus. And, you know, then that's what I'm going to focus on doing. That's where his mind is. And, the whole deal is where are you going to take the mind? You're going to take it to a beach somewhere when you're in the middle of a game and the count's full. Are you going to, yes. you know, would you rather him step back and take it to, you know, make making sure his focus is on 
you know, executing pitches. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I mean, yes. Well, what you're saying is to re-engage. See, they, they come out of engagement. Pitchers come out of engagement with what you're saying is their job and what they want to do. And they come out of that engagement and they go into something else. And what you're saying is to re-engage. But Larry, you said something very important and you're way smarter than you know. So you said you don't want them to say, to talk about what they don't want to do. You want them to stay in the, what are they going to do? Now, let me tell you how smart you are. So, and this is an example, and I know there's lots of guys out there that golf. So I think people know before I worked with pitchers, I don't golf, but I had a gift for seeing the swing when you hit driver. And so I used to work with golfers and they would come in and tell me all their stories. And I only worked with them on that specific thing and on training for that. So I went out to the golf course a few times with different golfers. They said, would you watch my other stuff? And I would ask them. I thought it was interesting the way golf courses are designed. And I love that the architects put water next to the greens and they put it next to bunkers. And I mean, all kinds of weird things in the design. And the golfer who's who they're neurotic. It's why I don't work with them anymore. I mean, that is a crazy sport. But they would be telling themselves, don't hit the water. Don't hit the water. <laughs> and the ball would go in the water. And I'd say, well, what are you telling yourself? Your brain doesn't know you said don't go in the water. It's hitting water. It's hearing water and it, it directs it to the water, which is exactly what you are talking about. The brain is unreal. If people would understand, your brain is more unreal than the computer you're working on. The iPhone that you think is amazing because it knows things, <laughs> your brain's more complicated than that. And if you can direct it, that's why my strategy, my solution with pitchers is to re-engage them in their strategy. What you just said is take on a way of talking to yourself that has to do with what you want to do not what you don't want to do. And the truth is, Larry, if they articulate to themselves, I don't want to throw, I don't want to go upstairs on this guy, or I don't want to do this. They, the brain hears that and they and it sends the little wire to the hand and you release it and the ball is high because you said it. So the language you use with yourself is very important to what the outcome is going to be. So that's what you actually just said. That's science. I mean, we know that that's the way the brain works. So awesome for you. And that's a wonderful message. The pitchers have to understand, and let's put it this way, maybe what I'm saying isn't 100% correct. Maybe somebody could challenge me on a few things, but it's the way we want to create the scenario. We want to frame it this way because it has a better outcome. So if a pitcher knows it's not abstract that he can talk himself into throwing balls, it's not abstract that the stress he's feeling is going to make his mechanics different. It's not abstract that he's in control of everything he does by what he's thinking and what he's focusing on. So for us to teach them to be better focused pitchers, and the way you do that is by getting them involved in a bullpen in a different way. Get them involved in a different way than just throwing pitches, mixing in just to whatever. And I'm pretty sure that high-level pitchers do this automatically. You know, they have a structure to things, but it is a way to take our younger pitchers and teach them how to focus, to have them create a plan and then say, okay, now go do it. But you can't, you can't stop doing it until you execute it. Just like I did with this guy. And it took him a minute. And when he saw that he could control it, and I think this is what changed him. It wasn't the assignment I gave him. It was really about how, what he learned doing it, which was one, he could, after trying something, and failing actually executed and that he could stay so involved for like X number of minutes that he found a new place in himself that he'd never been. Plus, he was only working with that assignment 
So all of a sudden, everything else, he didn't even see everything else. And in sports psychology, we have a term called narrowing your bandwidth. So when a basketball player is up to the free throw line, they've got people behind him, you know, waving arms. He has to know how to narrow what he's seeing so that he actually has a way to block that out. And that is a skill that you learn, but you can't learn it until you understand that's what you have to do. And you can't learn it well if you don't understand that it's actually a skill and that everybody has to do it. A lot of times the pitchers think they're the only one having this problem. So narrowing the bandwidth during a bullpen and being able to focus on just the one thing they're doing is critical. And that's all the things that you're saying as a coach that you actually do. And, and to make this really tangible practices, I think is the, is the key. But I absolutely believe that all of our training with our pitchers has to be, we have to start including this more into what we talk to them about. And I think that there's not enough emphasis on this. But after seeing this last week, I've actually never seen it. In fact, one of the pitchers that got pulled is one of the best pitchers. And hopefully, hopefully he will have understood that this isn't that he took a turn and now he's downhill. No, this is a momentary thing that he just didn't have the skills to get himself out of. And see, that's the thing. That is what we want. We don't want pitchers to think they're going downhill. It's just that, oh, I need I need another tool in my toolbox. You know, I, I need to saw this piece of wood and I don't have the right kind of saw. So does that make sense, Larry? Absolutely. It's, uh, it's tough. I have a funny story. When I uh, coached in San Diego in 05, 2005 with the San Diego Surf Dogs, and that was the last year Ricky Henderson played baseball professional baseball mm-hmm. I just found myself sometimes you know throwing batting practice and when he'd hit the first thing that came to my mind was oh my god don't hit him don't <laughs> hit him just don't hit him and I never did but I, it was like all I could do to just get that out of your mind get it out of your mind it was just yes that's just a small example of what guys go through you know whether doing anything hitting pitching I mean you know no, multiple sports you know like you said shooting free throws anything you know, your mind can take you to a pretty, you know, crazy place if you let it. And so I believe it's something that you certainly need to, you know, we probably need to train or use. I know we're guilty. I'm probably guilty for sure that we need to work on it more than we do. But yes, it's uh, it's good stuff. Yes. Mental skills, if you think of them as tangible, and this is why I got so frustrated in my training and then decided to go in a different direction and actually help the athlete perform better physically so we wouldn't go into these places, but making it as tangible and as physical and just that comfort, knowing that it's just another skill. And if I practice it more, you know, I will get better at it just like I practiced my fastball and I'm really good at it now. And just like this, Players need to understand that. So anyway, I I love uh, that you brought that up because uh, that has been one of the number one things on my mind. And the second thing that I want to talk about and the last topic, and this is really a message that I want to send out to youth coaches and to possibly high school coaches as well. At the beginning of the season, prior to all the playoff games, I've listened to a lot of shows and they were talking about this one particular pitcher who was going to be so necessary, but that he's been out with an injury and it was an elbow injury and they didn't know if they could bring him back. And every day it was, well, is he going to start? Well, we don't know yet. He threw a side and he was pretty good. And the conversation was going on and on and on. It was on a team that I don't ever watch. I didn't know who they were talking about. So anyway, this pitcher ends up making a start and I'm not watching the game. And I get a text from one of my pitchers and says, did you see so-and-so watch him? I can't even watch him, his mechanics. So I turned the station and I go, what? And I didn't realize he's this pitcher that everyone had been talking about. Well, we hope he can come back. We hope he can come back. Now, we all know what a clean pitcher looks like, right, Larry? You use that term all the time. He's clean. We know what a clean delivery looks like, right? Mm -hmm. And we also know 
a delivery that's maybe not totally clean, but the guy gets the job done. But he's, you know, there's a category where the guys look completely bizarre, but they get the job done. And you wonder how they get it done, but they get it done. But they're also not injured. This is a pitcher who, during the inning that I watched him, was so bizarre and so with his movement. So I, I, it was, I understand what this person said when they said he's hard to watch. He got pulled after 12, 14 pitches because his elbow was hurting again. And of course I go, of course it was hurting. I mean, it was scary. So first of all, when we've got a valuable pitcher and he's throwing strikes, I understand now what you coaches think about when you're like, I don't want to change him. Because I've had I've had professional pitching coaches say to me, you know, for the major leagues, if I change his mechanics and then he stops throwing strikes, I'm going to lose my job. That brought a whole new awareness to me. And then as my years went on and I started working with more elite pitchers, I knew, I know the stress of that. But when a guy's injured, you have a different situation. But even though with this guy being apparently so valuable and have had him having an injury, and apparently he's had a history of this injury, nobody, nobody, nobody ever said way back before he's, you know, years ago when this all started, nobody ever said, well, let's look at his delivery to see if something in his delivery is what keeps causing the pain. And then maybe if it's a small thing, we can at least decide if it's something we can adjust. That never happened. And I think it never happened because of the thing I just mentioned. I understand now what it's like when you've got a valuable pitcher that you are afraid to make changes. So I said to myself, what is the take home message from this? And the take home message for me that I could come up with was to the youth coaches and to the coaches in high school. When you've got a guy, a kid that's exhibiting crazy mechanics, and we know what crazy mechanics look like, don't we, Larry? Absolutely. You don't have to know what I know or know how to analyze it, because look at all of us who work in this field. We work with our eyes first. We have eye data that is usually very accurate. If you have an, especially up to the age 12, there is no reason to allow a 10 year old to throw like a maniac. There is no reason. I don't care if he's throwing gas. You know, when I hear he's 11 and he throws gas and then I look at him, this is the toughest time. 11 and 12. First of all, the parents you know, they're they're so excited their kid throws hard. They don't care that how he throws it. But at the early ages, and really the truth is, Larry, people ask me, I say, you better change your kid's mechanics by the time he's 12. Because at 12, they start their swag era, right? 12-year-olds mm-hmm. who are throwing, pitching well, go into this swag era where they don't want to change anything because they're the big kahuna and they want to like still throw hard. And once he's 12, they're most, they're most easy to change at nine, 10 and 11. That's actually the truth. You have to know what you're doing to change it, but that's when they're the most amenable on a mental level, but 12 and 13, it becomes difficult, but they're still, especially if they start having injuries. But I think that we as an industry have to, this guy on the mound, this major leaguer, I know he's been throwing like this since he was a kid. And my heart went out to him. His career may be over. And I'm saying where my, my brain said, where were his youth coaches? Because the kind of way he was throwing was the way you see little kids that are actually very wired to be power pitchers. Their bodies are out of control at that age, so they just throw the heck out of the ball, and but they're not throwing right. You can find a way to preserve the fire and preserve the power, but allow him to and teach him how to throw correctly or efficiently. And I said, where were these guys coaches? Because now at this level, who wants to touch him? And I get that. 
So my take home message from what I saw was, and we know how many injuries there have been. And most of the injuries you see in the major leagues, they're really for for reasons that are small adjustments, usually in timing, might be a little position of the wrist or a position of the foot. But I'm talking about the guys who throw so crazy and then they're always injured. And that to me is like something that should never have happened. And I think as an industry, if we start paying more attention because the injuries are going up, we know this, and the age of serious injuries are going down. So if we know that's the direction and we can start paying attention. So when our brain goes, wow, look at that kid, he's throwing gas, but wow, what a mess that we take heed to that awareness, that to that intuition we have. We say, you know what, let's help him because he's got promise, but let's get him right before he gets to the place where people are afraid to touch him. Yeah, no doubt. It's important. And you see it a lot. And there's a lot of guys that coaches see that there's changes that will probably need to be made, or you're just going to fear that they're going to end up hurting themselves down the road. And that's the catch. You know, he's successful right now. He's getting people out and he throws really hard, but yeah, but what's he going to be like when he's 18, 19, 20? Is he, is he even going to be healthy to pitch? Is he, you know, you want him to be available. You want him to play as long as they can and you want him to do it pain free. That's for sure. So what does a coach say to himself when he, so when we've got the youth teams, the youth, youth travel teams, you've got to have people that sign up for it, right? And they don't sign up for teams that don't get W's, okay? And so he's, he's running a business based on people that come and uh, play for him. And, and I don't fault anybody for that. We all run businesses. We are a business, okay? We, we want success, whatever that looks like. So we've got the travel coaches with the young kids, the nines, the tens, and elevens, who, by the way, by many people's opinions, break a lot of rules over pitching kids, et cetera. So you've got a travel owner who wants to have a team that's known for winning, so everybody wants to be on their team. So you've got that coach, and then you've got the coach when, when they're in middle school that they know they're going to high school and they want to get the kids you know, able to go to a good high school with a good baseball team. So they're already being looked at in eighth grade. And then you've got the high school coach whose job is dependent on, you know, being liked by everyone, not having parents write the office and say, got to, got to get rid of this coach for one reason or another. And also wants to win games because that's another variable, especially because sports brings money into the schools. What does a coach say to himself? Is it a binary thing like this kid's good and he's throwing strikes, but man, it's ugly and he's going to hurt himself. And he does. He especially does say, my arm gets sore, my arm gets sore. And then he's fine. And, you know, the kids are resilient. So what they're saying doesn't always mean anything. If we see that they could injure themselves, sometimes we have to go in that direction of believing that. But what does a coach say to himself when he's in that position that we almost understand it at a major league level and maybe even at a college level because you are you know that if a kid can get drafted and you see something. and But at the younger level where it's almost like, to me, a responsibility in development, I guess what I'm saying is how does a coach reconcile that he's there to actually develop kids and their skills, but I got to have a winning team. So I don't want to touch the kid. What advice do you have for those coaches, Larry, as to how they reconcile that? Or is this the nature of the beast? And is this why we have kids that grow up sometimes throwing crazy and end up injured at an early age because there is no solution? I think sometimes they maybe don't feel like they have the ability to make the improvements that need to be made or You know, and then, of course, for that organization, wins are important. But I mean, I think they just have to have to be willing to reach out to to, to somebody that that can help them. And and you'd like to think that, you know, that they would there's somebody in their area or their region that can certainly help them or, you know, ask someone to come out and take a look at a kid or take some video and, and shoot it to somebody who you think might be able to give a little bit of advice. They have to be willing to do that. If they're not willing to do that, then nothing's going to change. So the number one, they either feel maybe inadequate that they don't feel like they can do it, or 
maybe they're just a little apprehensive to reach out to folks. I mean, I think it's, I think that's one thing that could help baseball in general is if local, you know, youth coaches, you know, reach out to the high school programs and the college programs in their area and their cities, because people would be more than happy to help them. That's kind of where it starts. But, and, and you got to get over the, you know, I've, I've never recruited one kid and asked him how many games he won when he was a 10, 11, 12 year old. I don't care. I could care less. That's not what it's about. And that's what they get hung up on. Um, and, and I get it. You know, like you said earlier, it's a business. You know, they want folks on their, in their travel organizations that are successful. They want to win and they want to be able to put on their websites that they moved on to go play at such and such university and or whatever organization, you know, professional organization. That's what's going to help them get more clients, so to speak, more baseball players. That's what they rely on. But, you know, at some point, I mean, nope, the people that are recruiting and are seeking these players, you know, as high school, college and professional players, we could care less how many games they win. You know, that's the that's the least important thing to us. We want all of them to be able to play as long as they can play. If they're healthy, they're going to get to stay on the field. If they're not healthy, they're not going to stay on the field. They don't get to play. So there's no definitive answer, I don't think. It's just takes a takes a lot of effort on everybody's part to just do what's best for the kid, do what's best for the player. Well, you know, you said something really, really important, which is the coach makes the decision whether it's I'm going to help this kid's mechanics or I'm going to refer him out or I'm going to bring someone in. And I guess one of the things that I think is the purpose of po- the podcasts I do because these aren't easy decisions and there aren't always solutions. But when you have a thousand or a few thousand people listening or you have coaches listening going, wow, that point is good. But yeah, what is the solution? One of the things I rely on in all the things that I teach when I'm doing a podcast and also with having an expert like you just say things is you can't unhear what you hear. And when a problem is identified, that maybe it be, it's a simple problem that you've kind of had, it goes across your brain, but you push it to the side. But then when it's brought to bear, you hear it. You hear other people discussing it. All of a sudden, it's not as easy to ignore. And I think that with less people ignoring it, even if we don't have a solution yet, there'll be at least more coaches thinking about it. And maybe the next time you go to your practice and you see a kid, and you know he's good, but you know, you don't know how you know, but you know that he's going to hurt himself, that you take it upon yourself to think about that situation differently, and hopefully organically, a solution or something will be done. And I think that is really the purpose of why we have these discussions. So anyway, your insight is so valuable, Larry, and I can't thank you enough. And I thank you so much for being on this podcast with me during the season. But guess what? I want to have one more podcast before the season is over. And I hope you will join me. And it's been a short season. I can't believe it. But so be it. This has been an unusual year. And uh, so to the listeners, expect us back. If I can talk Larry into it, expect us back probably in two weeks, uh, maybe somewhere in the middle of the actual World Series playoffs, so we can uh, have another interesting discussion on whatever topics come up for us. So thank you so much for joining me again today, Larry. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And you can count me in. I'll be there. Okay, awesome. And thank you, everybody. Remember, you can go to Angel Borelli Pitching on YouTube to see podcasts where I'm teaching with visual tools. You can email me at angel at gymscience.com if you have any questions or any ideas for topics. And thank you again for listening.